Hello, welcome to LPAC TV. I'm Chris Landry and John Hofel here with me today. And we wanted to further discuss the issue of the worldwide uh, crisis slash phenomena of the revolutions and protests which are going on all around the world, which seemingly to most uh, seem to be disconnected from each other. When the fact is, is that they are all connected by the British monetary inner alpha group system, which is causing hyperinflation, uh, not only in the food uh, markets, but also in the other commodity markets, such as um, oil, for instance, which is the energy for which these countries depend upon. So increasingly, uh, life is becoming impossible to live for these people all around the world, from Wisconsin to Bahrain. And uh, the only thing that can stop it is uh, government reform, especially in the United States, and going back to Glass-Steagall. And the only solutions being proposed right now, uh, as of the moment, is the slash and burn policies of especially the Republican Party, but also of Obama himself. So, John, what do you have to say about this? Well, I'd say that when you have a an em empire whose policy is genocide, to reduce the population of the world by two-thirds. Mm -hmm. That when those measures begin to be implemented, there are going to be a lot of people around the world who protest, who don't want to be killed in order to protect the, uh, the glory of the empire. And that that's essentially what you're seeing breaking out hmm. around the world, that the particulars are a little bit different in each country, but the, it's the resistance to being destroyed that is causing people to act. And in the Middle East, you see, it comes out of the, the curtailment of the food supply, that you're either, you can't get enough food or you can't get enough food at a price you can afford. Mm -hmm. Well, the policy of the British Empire, of this, uh, which is a series of cartels, like food cartels and you know financial cartels and other things, which have systematically cut back food production in the world through globalization. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, then you have these financial crises, which are the trigger for further speculation in food, which runs up the prices. So you have this uh, combination of a fall in production and a fall in availability of food and a spike in the prices. Mm. You know, which is the, you know, sort of the Enron model for food, right? Not good. And this is what, you know, so you see this. You see in places like Wisconsin, the rebellion because there's just austerity. The, the, this idiotic governor uh, is implementing Austrian school style slash and burn economics. And the Austrian school is Venetian fascism. And this is the Austrian school that Rand Paul and Ron Paul both adhere to. Yes. And the people claim them to be economic geniuses because yes. of this. Well, it seems like they are revolting against that. Well, they are okay. because these policies are designed to kill them. You know, so people may not understand all of the details about what these policies are, the philosophies behind them, the political power behind them. You know, they may not really understand exactly where they're coming from. They probably, I mean, it's probably more difficult to understand because it's, a lot of it's esoteric knowledge anyway. Yeah. But there's a physical reality. Yeah, it's not that hard to figure out when the system that you're depending on for your life is trying to kill you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, yeah. you see that, and you see that, you know, that's what the governor of Wisconsin is. He's turning the government apparatus against the people and basically trying to kill them. And this is governor, what we call him is Governor Death Walker. Yeah of Wisconsin. Uh, this is uh, basically trying to eliminate uh, teachers, right? Is that, that's the... Yeah, that's the, the start, the, the elimination of public sector union, unions. You know, so, but you're targeting, it's just the beginning. You know, the, the way this is being played up in a lot of the press and by a lot of the, uh, the propaganda whores Mm. who work for the bankers. The depress. Yes, yes. Yeah, is, the depress. You know, that the public sector is, we have a crisis now, the public sector is overpaid. People in the private sector have taken losses, taken cuts. So now maybe the public sector should take cuts, you know, and this is good. They're living too high on the hog. Let's 
bring them down a notch. This is just your classic imperial divide and conquer. Hmm. That, you know, the way the empire controls the world is to set one group of the population off against another group. And it's so clear that that's what's being done here. And that this is the whole austerity push is, all right, these people have too much, these people don't have enough, let's balance it out. You know, well, you balance it out by killing everybody. <laughs> that's the end result of this. So this is, this is extraordinarily destructive. It's Austrian school fascist austerity. And it's got to be stopped because the only thing standing between us and complete chaos is a functioning government that adheres to the principles of our Constitution. Yeah, it almost seems that there's not really much of a difference between death, Governor Death Walker and Gaddafi. I mean, recently, I guess you had the now former Attorney General of Indiana who had proposed that they use live ammunition on the protesters. The in Deputy order to control Attorney them? General, yeah, the Deputy Attorney General said that the uh, protest that. Wisconsin authorities should use live ammunition on the protesters. That sounds like Gaddafi. Yeah, it's exactly what Gaddafi is talking about, right? A, a, using the military to attack. And, you know, I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. That's absolutely crazy. But that shows you the mentality of a section of these Republicans, that they've just, they've gone insane. And that they're so committed, they, their whole world revolves around money not people, not physical economy, but money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that's what the empire does. Yeah, here you had the case where the governments are being used to control the outburst and the outbreak of protest in the population. Now, that's the classic, it seems like the classic empire method of using the governments to enforce the policies of the empire Whereas the United States government was designed to defeat empires and protect the general welfare of its people. I mean, I think that's, I mean, that's a big irony here. It is. I mean, you know, think back to the original Tea Party. The Boston Tea Party. The Boston Tea Party and the Tea Party movement run by the Sons of Liberty was a direct attack on the policies of the British Empire and the policies of the British East India Company, which was the company that, that became the empire. Mm -hmm. Because the empires are these private interests. They're not, the empire is not a government. The empire is a collection of private interests. Like Wall Street. Like Wall Street, okay. And so now what do you have if you, you have, we formed a government according to the principles laid out in our Declaration of Independence in the Constitution precisely to protect us against the predatory nature of this empire, the, the British empire. The machinations of the empire. Yes. Okay. Yes. We formed it in defense. It was the highest form of government organization ever devised by man, and it still is. And it beat the empire. We defeated them. Right. Which is why the empire has worked so hard to subvert that from within. Half of our revolution was the military battle. But then the other half of the revolution seemed to be, what do we do about how do we uh, direct credit to develop our nation that's, you know, this new nation that's in debt, in tremendous amounts of debt? I mean, it wasn't Alexander Hamilton didn't say, well, we're in debt, we're just going to have to fire everybody. Yeah. So the real revolution was almost not just in fighting off these soldiers and these troops and General Cornwallis and all these, you know, these subjects, um, but to establish an economic system which then allowed for the development of the creative potential of human beings. Yeah. I mean, as Benjamin Franklin said, you know, a republic, if you can keep it. But in order to keep a republic, you have to have an educated citizenry. You mm -hmm. have to have a citizenry that actually understands what the function of a republic is, mm -hmm. what these ideas are, and to make sure that you keep the government on track. And that's where we went wrong. Our federal government has now been taken over by the empire from the president on down. You look at Obama, he's a British puppet. Mm -hmm. his, his ideas come from Britain. You look at the Congress, the Democratic Party, Nancy Pelosi and company, British puppets. You know, I mean, you look at the speed at which these people have gone along with the bailout and continue to go along with the bailout. 
Now you have the Republicans that are coming in that are that are taking the slash and burning one step further. Mm -hmm. All right. Every time you switch parties, you throw out the people who are in office because they're not not doing anything to protect the general welfare of the population. Right. All right. So you say we threw out the Republicans under Bush, and the Democrats were supposed to fix things. They made it worse. Sure did. So they got, they got thrown out. Now the Republicans are back in. They're making it worse. You know, but if you throw them out, you bring the Democrats back in, you're not going to get anywhere because they're just going to make it worse because the government at the top is under the control of the big money. And they're, they're fascist. I mean, you know, you just look at the Obama health care plan, the death panels and things like that. That tells you what you need to know about the nature of the Obama administration. Saving the economy, um, according to them, saving the economy would be to save the financial paper, meaning the, the mortgage-backed securities and all these various types of things. And if they can do that, then somehow the credit markets will get started again, people will have money to spend, then everything will be okay. Well, that's, that's not the case. That's not what's going on. I mean, you've given, how many trillions of dollars have we given to Wall Street and then how, how much are we trying to save by cutting out the public workers of Wisconsin? I mean, you're talking fraction, a, a mere fraction of the total bailout. How do people respond to that? You know, you're giving trillions of dollars to Wall Street, but you can't even give the states a couple billion dollars to help them make ends meet, at least in the time being, I mean, yeah, in, well, in the immediate you know, period? It, it shows you that, the, that these these people have become either monetarist or complete whores <laughs> for money. Right. To what extent they, people like Nancy Pelosi actually believe that this system is, needs to be protected because it's the right system versus this is where we get the money, this is where we get the power. Right. Who knows and who cares? Who get, it doesn't yeah. really matter. The, I, the, the problem is they're selling us all down the river. All right. They've written a blank check for the bailout. Sure. I mean, you can look at all the various figures, and, and but the the riots, the, the the food the food riots are a reflection of the policies, the same policies of the is the bailout, because what we're doing is through the Federal Reserve, we're giving money to Wall Street, low interest rate loans. Mm -hmm. We're warping the whole economy in order to subsidize Wall Street. They take this money and they look, okay, where can we make the highest rate of return with this money? All right, well, we can't do it in the mortgage market anymore because that died. It's toast. You know, the stock market isn't going up fast enough. Mm -hmm. But, hey, people have to eat. So let's speculate in food. Let's speculate in oil. Uh -huh. Let's make as much money as we can off of the food people have to eat. And the result of that is what you see breaking out. You know, people don't get enough to eat, so they rebel. Sure. I mean, these policies of saving Wall Street are what's killing us. And, you know, it's not just Wall Street, because Wall Street is an appendage of the British Empire. This is, this is the system that was created by the Inner Alpha Group. Sure. Yeah. And this is what we're moving to save. And we've seen this in history before with things such as the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. So let's, I mean, let's talk about how we can prevent that from happening because that seems to be what might happen. Uh, that, that's the type of direction that the people's rage might take them unless they have a clear understanding of how to be a citizen of a republic in a sense. And that's, uh, in a sense, it's almost like as if you could say that whether the people know it or not, what they want in the protest, the types of reforms they want, whether they know it or not, is to change this system, the system that is they have now recognized as killing them, as taking away their livelihoods. I mean, they've lived with it for a long time, but now it's to the point where they can't, you know, get energy and oil and they can't eat. And the one thing that Lyndon LaRouche has brought up as the thing that's going to cut that off is Glass-Steagall. Which is the yep. government, right? Right. Well, what will that do? Not only, I mean, we already know that Glass-Steagall, in a sense, will put up the firewall that'll separate the, the banks, you know, like the good banks from the, the insane casino banks. Mm -hmm. But how will it deal 
say more directly with the food crisis or the commodities crisis generally? Well, we shut down the bailout. You take Glass Steagall, you're gonna you're gonna end the casino. All right, no more casino, no more derivatives. All right, that means the speculation is out. Because without the government subsidies, without access to the deposits that they're raiding from these, the banks are raiding their deposits in order to speculate. Hmm. You know, without that, you cut that off, they die. Because they're bankrupt. They're hopelessly bankrupt. They're feeding off of the rest of us. So you end their ability to feed off the rest of us and they're gone. Now that's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. It's we don't need Wall Street. We don't want Wall Street. And if we let those guys continue to do what they're doing, we're not going to survive. So we're going to shut it down with Glass-Steagall. All right. Then we're going to go back to a credit system because we're going to take control of our own money. We don't control the dollar right now. The empire controls the dollar. The Federal Reserve is an agent of this British imperial monetary system, of this central banking system. Mm -hmm. The Federal Reserve cares more about what the Bank of England and the Bank for International Settlements and uh, those other European central banks think than it does about what the American population thinks. And that's pretty clear the way they keep screwing us. Sure. Yeah. All right. So we're going to put an end to all of that. We're going to take control back of our money. But, you know, the irony is that when the U.S. government issues money today, it does so by giving treasury bonds to the Federal Reserve, which then sells those bonds out on the open market to the parasites, and then gives the money from those bond sales back to the federal government. But since fundamentally it, the federal government is what is creating the money, there's no reason on earth for us to pay a tribute to have to borrow the money that we're creating from the markets. Uh -huh. It's a scam. It's a giant scam. Now what the Hamilton did, Alexander Hamilton with his credit system, is by, you know, bypass all of that and say we're going to issue government credit directly through a National Bank of the United States for projects that we deem to be worthwhile. So we're not spending the, our money to save this imperial parasite, this financial system. Right. We're spending our money to develop our own country and protect our own people. It's a completely different system with a completely different intent. It's not the Adam Smith liberal, pleasure-pain, market-driven system. It's a system driven by human reason and human creativity, which decides what we need to do in order to develop the planet as a whole, Gen really, the planet as a whole. When you're talking about big projects, like we're talking about NAWAPA today, yeah. you're talking, I mean, we, the viewers of this know somewhat what that means just from the videos we have posted on mm -hmm. our website. The market won't do that. Yeah. It doesn't want to do that. No, the market is designed to kill people, to reduce the world population, to <laughs> make as much money off of them before they die as possible. And that's what it's doing. Yeah. Right now, that's what it's doing. Yeah. And, you know, that's, you got to break that up. And so, no more speculation on food. You, no more speculation on oil. You look at the price, the way the price of oil is shooting up at the moment. Okay, this is not because of the crisis in Libya. This is because we have turned oil over the last several decades into a highly speculative product. There's lots of oil out there. There's a surplus of oil. There are tankers out there owned by investment banks mm -hmm. that are just full of oil sitting around waiting for the price to go up. Off the coast of Somalia somewhere. Probably. Yeah. So, you know, we have, there's plenty of oil. There's no shortage. This whole thing is rigged. Mm -hmm. All right, you think about what it does to an average family in the United States. Yeah. When the when the price of gasoline goes up over three dollars and now they're projecting four dollars, five dollars, they could get away with it hundred and fifty dollars a gallon. Yeah. You know, and all these projections are not really statements of uh physical economic reality. They're statements of intent to run the price up to through speculation. So it's not even about supply and demand as they would argue that the economy is based upon. This is what the Adam Smith argument is. Yeah, yeah. It's about 
a bailout in, right. in, in the sense of the speculators. They're saying, this is how we're going to make our money now, and you need this, so right. screw you guys. Yeah. So you look at what's happened over the past few decades. All right. We have oil, oil, which means the and speculation in oil, which runs the price of gas way up, mm -hmm. All right, which eats into everybody's budget, seriously. You have the mortgage game, which caused enormous speculation in housing, which raised housing costs for people who bought and people who rented. Mm -hmm. All right. More Venetian debt farming. All right. Food price speculation, which is raising the price of food. Right. So people are having to pay more and more and more for the necessities of life in order to support this bubble. And then the bubble blows up and we're told we have to defend the bubble and we have to have more austerity on the population. So we're going to have to have higher prices less government, all of this, it is absolutely insane. If you just step back and look at the broad sweep of this, you know, it's just absolutely insane and we're not going to survive if we don't stop it. And the only thing we have that can stop it, I mean, we have the, the principles, the universal principles, we have the policies that will stop it. Mm -hmm. But what you, rehab, what you need in order to do this is a functioning federal government which means we have to take back our government from these idiots. You know, no more just voting the old guys out and, and bringing in the new guys. And then, you know, a lot of people who came in were supposed to be like this. You had this big irony where the Obama Democrats were saying, well, you know, we're just going to continue to bail out, bail out, and then we're going to have the, the death care policy. And the people of the United States were like, this is crazy. You know, this is insane. And they revolted. And then you had this... Tea Party, but not necessarily Tea Party, but the, I mean, most of the people are probably just having natural reactions to the insanity, but you have a certain type of leadership which has been characterized by the slash and burn Republicans like Rand Paul, Ron Paul, mm -hmm. Governor Death Walker, as if the answer lies in how money is being handled. Yes. You know, like, like we, need to bail out the, we need to bail out Wall Street to save the financial assets, or we need to cut spending upon the public sector because that's why we're bankrupt, as if that's the cause of the crisis. Both of those are, are, are nuts. And people have reacted to both of those so-called solutions in a very a good way, but it's also been a very enraged and angered way. And it seems that, that what people should do is get an ennobling sense of what it actually will take to drive the human race into the future in a positive way. And that seems to be more of what Glass-Steagall is designed to do and what our Constitution is really designed for. Instead, basically, instead of going into a French Revolution-style uh, fascist dictatorship, you can actually have a real revolution and go and do something like what FDR did, but probably, who knows, much better. Yeah. Tearing things down is not going to solve anything. You have to start rebuilding according to the, you know, and you have to go back to the Constitution. If you don't start with the Constitution, you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. And read the preamble to the Constitution. Yeah, read the preamble, because that's what it's, these so-called Republicans went in there and read the Constitution. They said, well, just not look at the preamble. It's not a social contract <laughs> where you have this series of rules. Yeah. It's a philosophy. These are the principles by which our nation is to operate. That's the law of the land. And every and, law and, that has to be measured up against those principles. Yes. If it does not fit within the principles laid out in the preamble of the Constitution, it is illegal. Which makes everything Governor Death Walker is doing <laughs> illegal. It makes Obama's health care program illegal. It makes the, at this point, you could probably say the whole Congress is illegal. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But economy is not about <laughs> money. This is the fundamental problem that these idiots have. Right. They want to hold on to their money. You know, all these rich guys, and most of Congress, you know, Congress is full of millionaires. Wall Street's full of billionaires. You know, all these people with all their money, and they're holding on to their money as tight as they can because mm -hmm. they see it evaporating. Yeah, it is. And they're passing all these laws to save their damn money. And they're having their millionaire friends in the press convince us that's what we need to do. That's right, that's right, that's right. And meanwhile, <laughs> the economy is physical. As we're, we see. <laughs> yeah. You know, that the economy is about things like production. The economy is about using human creativity 
to make breakthroughs in universal principles. Put those principles into work through technology to raise the standard of living of mankind, to raise the productive power of human labor, and uh, you know, raise energy flux density, move up to higher and higher levels of technology, uh, higher and you know, increase the capacity of the platform to allow for a more efficient economy and a higher standard of living. You saw an attempt at this even under uh, President Kennedy. I mean, the government was basically through the space program was ensuring that they were going to invest and in, in, in guarantee certain types of scientific you know, progress. Mm -hmm. So of course that encouraged the private sector to take up projects. Normally that they wouldn't do because, you know, why are you going to invest, you know, why, why try to go into space as a private company? You know, you're going to lose money doing it. But if you have a guarantee from the government saying, okay, we're going to ensure that uh, the scientific progress is going to be, uh, you know, taken care of, then the private sector can participate in that as opposed to the private sector deciding how the market, you know, wealth gets distributed or what gets developed. You know, and that, that hasn't worked. I mean, that's, that has failed. But under a, an, American, an American system, you have development. You need a science driver policy because the, the way an economy needs to be organized is around successive and accelerating successive breakthroughs in universal physical principles. Mm -hmm that you you figure things out faster and faster and faster so you increase the ability you increase the rate at which you're figuring things out you know you look at the the way we went from our first man flight to putting a man on the moon in a little over 60 years all right now that's a pretty impressive accomplishment that's the way things ought to work you know now think about all of the ramifications of that kind of technological development. Think about the ramifications of the development of high-speed rail as transportation, of uh, nuclear power as a form of generation of electricity. Mm -hmm. Now you think about electricity as a good example because everybody needs electricity. Okay. Under the Enron model, the idea, and under the deregulation of the electric electricity industry, which is still there, yeah. the idea is that it's a profit center and that you want to make as much money off of electricity as you can. The whole idea of Enron was to insert a financial middleman between the producers of electricity and the consumer in order to jack up the prices. And it was really, it was really based on the model of the oil, hmm. oil markets. Hmm. All right. Now... So electricity costs go up and up and up. Just another cost, another way of looting, you know, your average family, your average business. This is the way of another extracting wealth out of the population. As trying to make deregulation look like it's a good thing yeah. by right. allowing people to make lots of money off All of right. it. Right. Now how should electricity work? All right. You should have these electric utilities, which are monopolies within their own region but are highly regulated. And they produce power using nuclear power, hmm. and you produce it efficiently enough under those circumstances that you don't even have to meter it. You know, you can say, okay, you've got this size, this many square feet, huh. you know, this is your rate. You just pay a flat rate. You know, it's like the study that was done many years ago of the New York City subway state system, hmm. which showed that the subway, that the cost of collecting fares, that collecting fares cost more, that the system would be <laughs> cheaper and less expensive if it was free. Hmm. You know, so you, you need to have your electricity company make a profit. So they need to charge a rate at which they can make a profit. But they're not there to get rich. They're utility companies to produce electricity and they earn a profit in order to allow them to do that. This is not speculation, this is not extraction of wealth. Hmm. Now that's the idea you want to have for all of your infrastructure. Hmm. That your transportation system, you, know, you want to have more uh, 
mass transit, get not, more cars off the road. And not toll roads, things like that. Not toll roads. Okay. And you want to make them as cheap as possible to encourage people to ride them. Because it makes your economy more efficient. Hmm. The more efficiently people can get around, the more efficiently people can use these, you know, the increase of productive power of their labor, the more efficient and more productive your economy is. And the, the irony of this, this whole process you're describing is that you have to go into debt to do this type of stuff. Yeah. yeah. And this is what Hamiltonian credit is for. Hmm. You know, because the government, the role of the government is to provide the funding for those things which are too big for the private sector, to create the environment in which the private sector can thrive. You know, so you okay. have these, the Austrian school would call this socialism or communism. You know, they'd get all excited about it. But actually, you know, this is American system economics. This was how our nation was built. Mm -hmm. they're, so, they're so ignorant, they don't even understand how this nation was built. All these patriots running around claiming to be defending the country, they don't even understand what it is. All these Austrian school fascists running around saying that they're American constitutionalists. Yeah. It makes perfect nonsense. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, but that's the whole concept of how this is supposed to work. The government, it's like what JFK did with the space program. You launch this science driver space program, which then requires all sorts of breakthroughs in universal physical principles. Mm -hmm. which then get applied as technology, which transform the economy in which you're living. We're still living off of some of the developments of the space program. Mm -hmm. you know, now imagine if we had kept up that process in the way we should have. Well, Kennedy was famous for saying that a rising tide lifts all boats. Yeah, right? yeah. But that's the way it works. You make breakthrough after breakthrough. You, know, you, you build a plant with a technology. You know, you're going to build widgets or something. <laughs> you have this widget plant that's modern technology, very impressive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's got a lifespan. The equipment might have a lifespan of 20 years. All right. Now, modern economists would say, well, then, therefore, we have to make sure we get the full 20 years of production out of that plant. Mm. All right. And that's why they, it's a reflection of the fact that they don't understand anything. Because, in fact, after five or ten years, you may want to replace that plant because you've developed technology which will produce your product far cheaper and better. The idea is not to hold on to these fixed assets until you've milked everything out of them. The idea is to be continually upgrading your economy to make it more efficient, right. yeah. more productive, to increase the productive power of human labor. This is how you create wealth. This is something that... Wall Street hates because they don't actually produce anything. They just extract. They, they live by taking a cut out of all the money that passes through their system. Yeah. You know, it's, you look at the big office towers on Wall Street, and you're really looking at something that's no different from the giant casinos in Vegas. You know, you, you look at these casinos, and they're so grand and opulent and <laughs> all of this stuff, right? I mean, it's, it's mafia classy. It's really... <laughs> Disgusting. Yeah. But nevertheless, these grand, expensive buildings, well, how do they get paid for? They get paid for fleecing everybody that walks in the door. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the same principle as Wall Street because Wall Street is nothing but a casino. You look at these big bonuses, these big office buildings, the, you know, all of this fancy, oh, these guys must be doing something right. Mm hmm. Well, what they're doing is they're taking a piece out of you every day. Yeah. And we don't need that. We have to stop that. It's time to go back to producing things again, to go back to Hamiltonian economics, shut down the casino, rebuild the factories, and get back to work. And that requires the help of a federal government. It means that during a transition, we're going to have to make sure that nobody loses their house. Mm-hmm that we still have health care, we still have schools, fire departments, <coughs> these things. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to maintain the social safety net. Sure. Now that's the role of the federal government. Now in order to do that, we have to throw out all of these Austrian school fascists, you know, and other types of austerity, the budget cutters. And we have to go back to the general welfare 
We have to say, okay, we're all in this together. Our nation is going to pull together. We're going to pull out of this. We're going to be uh, stronger than ever before. And we are, in doing so, going to help the rest of the world pull out too. And we're going to have a, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats. Right. We're going to lead the world into a new renaissance. Now, this is what's possible. This is our role. This is our mission. It's what <coughs> the founding fathers did. That's one of the most important things I think that the viewers should get is that uh, it's not just a matter of uh, being angry. It's good to be angry, but it's also necessary that uh, we do the things necessary that are going to build a future. And it's what, it's what you're talking about. It's obviously what Lenin LaRouche has laid out as the necessary steps, beginning with Glass-Steagall. The answer is not in the slash and burn policy. The answer is not in... Uh, the bailout, the answer is in Glass-Steagall and rational thinking to deal with the crisis. As difficult as it is to, to get over just being purely angry and wanting to bring out the guillotine, right? You got to like really concentrate and think there is a solution. We can do, we, we can solve the problems and our constitution says we can. And you see this in this, in all of the meetings that we had last year, the, uh, town hall meetings and, you know, this continuation of the mass strike process, the um, toppling of governments, the changes in the Middle East. Right. All right. This has all been done peacefully. I mean, Qaddafi is, uh, Qaddafi and his friend in Illinois would do it differently, <laughs> but, uh, you know, people want solutions. They're looking, they're looking for help. They're looking to build things back up. So this has all been a very civilized, it's very encouraging because it, it, it is what you're saying, that people are approaching this from the standpoint of not let's get mad and tear everything down, yeah. but let's fix it. And to the extent that people have that attitude, then it is indeed possible to fix it. Mm -hmm. And you know, you resist all the temptations to get whipped up you know, by some of our Peep friends in the media mm. at uh, a Fox News network that won't be named, uh, or uh, the agent provocateurs that the government will send in or the oligarchy will send in to try to turn peaceful demonstrations violent and things like that. You know, you resist all of that. You just focus on the fact that this is, you know, we know what we have to do. We have to do this in a civilized, responsible way because otherwise everything will go to hell. And it is going to hell, you know, and we have to, we have to step up very quickly and fix it. And the good thing is, is that we've been around long enough on this planet, uh, the people of this planet have been around long enough to have witnessed the atrocities that the empire has committed against them in the past, in, all, in various nations around the world, whether it be in uh, Libya, Egypt, within the United States, and the memory of those atrocities should uh, drive, or well, probably is that is what is driving people. You get this, you get these reports from people that they remember these, they remember in history when they've had to fight against the empire. And it's not so cut and dry today, but that's exactly what it is. And uh, we have the tools to deal with it. And yeah, I think we should just leave it at that. Yeah. Let people think about that. Yeah, renaissance or genocide. Renaissance or Dark Age? Yeah. Yeah, and we'll let Prince Philip go become a virus, then we'll, then we'll just get rid of him. We have, a, we have a zoo. We'll set up a zoo. A virus zoo. Yeah, we'll put you know, all of these people <laughs> in a zoo, uh, maybe one of these drive-through parks like they have for the animals, and you know, so you can have organized tours through there and see how these people live in their natural habitat. Here's Lord so-and-so, here's Count so-and-so in yeah. his cage. We just put them in cages and have yeah. them on display. Yeah. be part of the Smithsonian. Yeah, and you know, the rest of us can go off into the modern world and they can stay in the Middle Ages. Yeah, and we can read about their, their Dark Age endeavors. Yeah. In the museum. Yeah. Okay, good, all right. <laughs> okay, well that's all the time we have for now. Uh, thanks, John. Sure. Been fun and uh, see you next time.